stage and she will give us an update on radiation therapy. Hi, good morning. I'm gonna put the timer on my phone. All right, my name is Nina Sanford. I'm a GI radiation oncologist um, at UT Southwestern. Um, and I have the pleasure of giving the fifth talk uh, right before lunch. Um, so thank you for tuning in. I hope some of you guys find uh, what I have to say um, informative. All right, so I'm gonna first talk about rectal cancer, trying to dovetail off of what Dr. Smith talked about, really focusing more on the radiation aspects of it. All right, so this is sort of a 20,000 foot overview of colon and rectal cancer that I talk about with, with my patients and how radiation fits in. Um, so I sort of start off by saying that colorectal cancer is similar biologically. Obviously we know that's a simplification. There are differences between right and left-sided colon cancer um, and colon rectal cancer, but really they're very different anatomically. Um, the colon sort of sits in the free-floating belly um, that's easier to access surgically and um, remove with negative margins, whereas a rectum sits in the narrow pelvis um, where there is a higher rate of local recurrence with surgery alone um, and thus a need for radiation therapy. Um, but we also know that not all parts of the rectum are equal. Um, so there's the upper, mid, and lower rectum, about five centimeters each. And we know that as we go down in the pelvis to tumors that are more distal, uh, the risk of local recurrence increases. Uh, surgery may entail a permanent colostomy via an APR. Um, and thus, the role of radiation therapy may be more important. So just going back uh, almost 20 years, this was a very important randomized study uh, conducted or reported in 2004. Um, prior to this, upfront surgery was used in locally advanced rectal cancer. Um, so this was a trial that randomized patients to either preoperative chemoradiation followed by surgery versus surgery and then postoperative chemoradiation, which was a standard of care. The study found that preoperative chemoradiation reduced the risk of local failures, uh, increased sphincter sparing uh, rates, um, and also decreased acute and lake toxicities um, without a difference in overall survival or disease-free survival. So after this trial, pre-op chemoradiation became a standard of care, the standard of care. So slide is very similar to what uh, Dr. Smith presented, but basically after this study for the next 15 years, this was sort of the most common regimen in locally advanced rectal cancer, long course chemoradiation, surgery, and then adjuvant chemotherapy. Um, things have become way more complicated over the last several years, and I'm not gonna go over every uh, bullet point here, every, every bubble and every trial, but basically they hedge upon either going to surgery, doing watch and wait, how to sequence total knee adjuvant therapy, short versus long course radiation, uh, what type of chemotherapy to give, and then not included in, these, um, in this graphic is even the role of radiation dose escalation, which I'll talk about, um, transadental excision surgery, so less invasive surgery, um, and also systemic advances, so many options now. So just a little bit um, about short versus long course radiation. I know Dr. Smith talked about this as well. Um, so long course chemoradiation is generally between 25 to 28 treatments, um, about two gray each, um, and given with a radiosynthesizing chemotherapy, either 5 if you're a capecitabine, uh, versus short course radiation is five treatments, five gray each over one week, uh, all consecutive weekdays and no chemotherapy. So looking at the figure below, um, patients and, and sometimes other providers ask, you know, when you're treating with radiation therapy, are you just treating the tumor? Are you treating around the tumor? And I answer, if we're just, just treating the tumor, we're not really helping because um, at least in the preoperative setting, that's gonna come out with surgery. So we treat where the tumor is and where there, there could be microscopic disease. So in the at-risk nodal regions in the mesorectum and some of the lymph node areas um, around that. So I wanna talk about a term in radiation that uh, we refer to as a biologic effective dose. So what is the biologic effective dose, uh, BED? So it is a measure of the true biologic dose delivered by a particular combination of dose per fraction and total dose of particular tissue. 
So what does that mean? It takes into the account the dose per fraction and a tissue's intrinsic radiation sensitivity. So that means that if you give five gray in one day or one fraction, it's a lot more powerful than giving five gray over two fractions. So sometimes patients ask, well, short course radiation, you're giving 25 gray. Is that half as potent as long course chemo radiation where you're giving 50 gray? Um, and the answer is no. Because the dose with short course is five gray per fraction, it's a higher dose per fraction, that is more potent than giving two gray per fraction, which is long course chemo radiation. So the BD of short course radiation is about 37.5 gray, um, and the BD of long course chemo radiation is about 50 gray. So it's still less, but not really half as much. And I think that will maybe factor into some of the data um, that I present later. And here's a formula uh, for calculating BD, also online calculators. All right, so what do uh, the studies uh, say about short course versus long course chemo radiation um, in, uh, in locally advanced rectal cancer? So these are some of the older studies, um, and I took this slide from Dr. Smith. Thank you for this awesome slide. Um, basically, um, there were a total of about 3,000 patients, um, and the, the, the take home from these studies was that there was no rural survival difference, no statistically significant differences in local recurrence for all these patients as a whole. Um, notably, this was all in the preoperative setting, so these were patients getting surgery, um, not patients that were managed with watching, which that data remains to be seen. Um, however, based on some of the data that Dr. Smith presented, um, and also an update from the Rapido study, um, if we believe that radiation dose does matter, um, is there a way we can increase the biologic effective dose to the rectal tumor to increase the rate of response? So this was presented, uh, I guess the updated version was presented at GI ASCO um, last month. Um, so this is the OPERA trial, not to be confused with the OPRA trial. Um, so this was a study of early stage rectal cancers, clinical T2 to T3B, N0 to N1, um, less than or equal to 10 centimeters from the anal verge, and they're randomized to external beam chemoradiation, long course chemoradiation as a control arm, versus um, long course chemoradiation plus a brachytherapy boost, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. Depending on if the tumor was less or greater than three centimeters, um, the patient either got the brachytherapy boost before long course chemoradiation or after. So what is brachytherapy? I'm sure you guys have already have heard of the term before, but it basically refers to internal radiation therapy. It can be done via seeds, um, like in prostate cancer, a catheter, um, a plaque, um, anything placed directly in or around the tumor. Uh, when you do that, you uh, permit the delivery of very high doses of radiation, up to upwards of 100 gray. Um, it's really only suitable for small targets. So you can see the figures from the presentation. Um, you know, this is kind of like an idealized intraluminal tumor. Um, but on the study, they give, they give 30 gray per fraction three times. That actually gives a biologic effective dose of 360 gray to the tumor. That's very high. Um, plus 45 gray to the pelvis. Uh, you can see on the pictures on the right that between the three treatments, here's an example of a tumor that really just melted away with the three treatments. So the clinical complete response at two years was 64% uh, for the patients receiving the stan standard long course chemo radiation. Again, these were earlier stage rectal tumors versus 92% with the, for those receiving a brachy boost and up to 97% um, for tumors less than uh, three centimeters. Um, so take home points, I think, from the trial. Um, ablative radiation can be curative. So these patients actually never received full FOX chemotherapy, never got oxaliplatin, only got CAPE or 5-FU with radiation. Um, however, there are many caveats to the study. Um, first, or to the practice, um, not all patients qualify for rectal brachytherapy. These are earlier stage patients. Uh, many centers uh, don't have the capability to do this type of brachytherapy. And then very importantly, you know, emphasizing quality of life, uh, we need toxicity data from this regimen. Uh, prior studies in rectal cancer and esophageal cancer have shown that uh, there are high, uh, not doses, high rates of toxicity for intraluminal brachytherapy. And then uh, a lot of questions still remain regarding organ preservation. Um, one is should organ preservation be the goal for all patients? Even if we think their, uh, their likelihood of achieving a complete response is low, 
Um, what is the optimal radiation regimen? Uh, what is the optimal timing for response assessment? Um, and what, how frequently, what modalities should be used for surveillance? So um, I think just bringing um, my portion and what Dr. Smith um, talked about and summarizing it all before I move on to other cancers, um, just summarizing some of the trials in total neodymium therapy. Um, this study Dr. Smith talked about was a timing study. Um, I think the take home from this study is that more full FOX and or a longer interval after chemo radiation um, improves the pathologic complete response rates um, up to 38% in this study. This was a timing trial published in 2015. Um, the PRODIGE study, so this was a study of using fulfirinox uh, versus fulfox uh, in locally advanced rectal cancer improves disease-free survival uh, compared to fulfox. Um, this is a regimen that we're using for younger, more fitter patients um, with locally advanced rectal cancer. Um, the RAPIDO trial, so this was a study um, looking at short course radiation in a total neodymium uh, uh, therapy uh, regimen um, showed that um, Short course TNT improved three year disease related treatment failure. That was really driven by lower rates of distant nets. Um, however, the local regional occurrence was actually higher with the short course radiation arm that was statistically significant at the five year follow up. It was 10 versus 6%. And then NRGGI002, uh, which Dr. Smith also talked about, this was a study looking at uh, TNT starting with chemotherapy with either PARP inhibitor or pembrolizumab. Um, showed that there was really no um, improvement in short-term clinical outcomes with the addition of the investigal investigational agents. Um, but I think the main point of the study was that total agent therapy was feasible and safe um, in a large U.S. cooperative group setting. Um, so I think there are still ongoing questions regarding TNT. Um, I don't think it's maybe appropriate for every patient, but probably appropriate for a lot. Um, one is patient selection. So should all T3, T4 um, no positive patients be receiving chemotherapy um, preoperatively um, sequencing radiation or chemotherapy first. I think there's different scenarios where one might do one or the other. Um, short course versus long course chemo radiation. Um, the value of surrogate endpoints, um, including the neoadjuvant rectal score, pathologic complete response, and clinical complete response. Um, and then also systemic therapy, either a triplet or doublet chemotherapy um, alone, and then uh, combinations with radiation. Um, so I won't uh, spend too much time on the organ preservation part, because Dr. Smith covered this um, in his talk, um, but I think we're going to have a lot of really exciting studies come out soon that really inform um, really the best way to um, maximize the chance of organ preservation in our rectal cancer patients. All right. So uh, with all that in mind, um, what do we do at UT Southwestern? This is where I work. Um, so some background about our institution. So we have a long history of hypofractionation and SBRT. Uh, we were early adopters of short course radiation, uh, even prior to the COVID pandemic. Um, a lot of our patients do come from our Dallas County Safety Net Hospital and present with very advanced disease. Um, so uh, first we uh, enroll on clinical trials uh, when we feel that they're appropriate. Um, so this was a uh, multi-institutional phase two randomized trial of the addition of a CD40 agonist immunotherapy agent to short course radiation um, and chemotherapy um, for high risk stage two um, or stage three rectal cancer. So the idea behind this is that um, immunotherapy in um, MSS rectal cancer, colorectal cancer has not been um, shown to be effective, but if we combine with radiation and chemotherapy, can we stimulate the immune system to uh, respond to the immunotherapy. Um, but what do we do off study? So I'll start with the bottom, which is uh, low rectal cancers require an APR. So if we feel, if the patient wants non-operative management as a goal, if they have extensive T4 disease or lateral nodes, uh, we do the OPA regimen, long course chemo radiation, chemotherapy, and then assess. Um, if the logistics preclude being able to come every day for five weeks, which is a real thing, that's a lot to ask of a patient, um, or if there is just a really low chance of um, getting um, a complete response, then I think short course radiation chemo is very reasonable. Um, if we feel that there is um, a substantial risk of micrometastatic disease, either they have a ele very elevated CA, um, extensive nodes, um, EMBI, then we'll start with chemotherapy first, 
followed by radiation and then assess. Um, moving to mid-upper rectal cancers, so um, if a patient has a tumor that's greater than 10 centimeters from the anal verge, T3AB, uh, node negative, negative CRM, um, then based on studies, upfront surgery and then uh, chemotherapy with omission of radiation is reasonable, and the prospect study um, will inform us more about this. Otherwise, our management is similar to low rectal cancers, perhaps with greater consideration of short course radiation, uh, given that there's no permanent colostomy risk. All right, so moving on to liver cancer. Um, so just a little bit of background. So radiation in the liver for HCC is not new. Um, however, prior to the advent of SBRT, it was toxic and ineffective. Uh, we know that high radiation doses to large volumes of liver can cause radiation-induced liver disease, which is um, largely irreversible and uh, potentially fatal as well. So um, this is probably review for some folks, but what is SBRT, SABR? So these are interchangeable terms. You've probably heard of both. So SBRT is stereotactic body radiation therapy. Um, SABR is stereotactic ablative radiation therapy. So basically it's radiation predicated on being able to deliver high doses to small volumes in few treatments. So going back to the concept I talked about earlier of biologic effective dose, um, if you give 40 gray in one fraction, which we have done for some of our liver met patients, you get a BD of 200 gray. That's an ablative dose. Um, we know from studies that uh, SBRT can be very effective um, with local control rates upwards of 90%, higher for smaller tumors, um, and it was pioneered in the lung and the brain. So when I think about uh, local therapy for uh, HCC, I separate into ablative versus arterially directed therapies. There are a lot of options. So you know, the question is, how does radiation fit in? When do you do SBRT? Um, and I think a good candidate for SBRT is uh, tumors, or good tumors uh, that are good candidates for SBRT are when they are adjacent to major vessels or bile ducts. Um, that's often a contraindication for RFA or if they have portal vein thrombosis, a, con a contraindication to taste insert, these are good candidates for SBRT. Um, obviously a lot of data on this slide, but really to show that HCC, some people believe it's not radiosensitive, it actually is. Um, so if you look at this, um, this study, uh, the one-year local control rate was between 80 and 95%. Even with the caveat that a lot of these patients were ineligible for other treatments or previously treated with other local modalities. Okay, so um, the presenter earlier talked about this study, so I, I won't go into too much detail, but this is a study of serafinib with or without SBRT um, in locally advanced um, HCC. They had to be unsuitable for refractory to or recurrent post-resection RFA or TACE. Um, these were advanced patients, uh, 193 patients ended up enrolling in total. Um, a lot of them had MVI and they had substantial portal vein involvement. And um, as was shown earlier, uh, radiation and uh, in the addition of radiation improved overall survival by three months. Uh, progression-free survival is improved. And I think this is actually very important. The time to progression was improved from 9.5 to 18.5 months. They did look at quality of life, but the number of patients who returned the surveys were not very high. I think this really highlights how challenging it is to get quality of life data long-term, particularly in patients who are sick. Um, but there it was suggestion of improved quality of life with the addition of radiation, um, with a third of patients um, having clinically significant improvement. So uh, take home points from this study. Um, in patients with advanced HCC, the addition of SBRT to serafinib improves OS, PFS, and time to pr progression um, as compared to serafinib alone. Um, SBRT may improve quality of life, um, should be considering patients, particularly those with macro, macro vascular invasion. Um, so the major caveat of the study. So it was started when serafinib was standard of care um, prior to um, the IMBRAE 150, showing that atezobeb has better overall survival as compared to serafinib, which has very low response rates. Um, there are several single arm studies showing efficacy of radiation and IO in um, HCC um, with prospective studies to come. So I really wanted to highlight this study, um, also presented at GI ASCO from Dr. Laura Dawson. Um, this was a study of patients um, with either HCC or liver uh, METs. Um, and it was a study of palliative radiotherapy um, in this setting. 
So who are these patients? These are patients where with a lot of liver burden, uh, disease liver burden, and um, extensive pain. And they're randomized to either receive best supportive care um, or radiation. And this was one fraction of radiation, eight gray. Um, the primary endpoint was the proportion of patients with improved pain on the brief pain inventory by at least two points one month after initiation. Uh, secondary endpoints were survival and pain improvement at three months. So um, going back to what I said earlier, that whole liver radiation can be very toxic. That's when given in high doses. This is one uh, treatment at eight gray. So these are patients with very diffuse liver metastases, uh, 66 total, uh, 43 were METs, and 23 had HCC. 60% um, were ECOG 2 or 3. Um, and what did the study find? So basically, um, by giving that single fraction of radiation, 67% uh, of patients had improvement in their worst pain um, and improvement in the other out outcomes as well as compared to best supportive care. Um, and there was also a trend to improve three-month overall survival, 51% versus 33%. And I really like that Dr. Dawson in, uh, incorporated these patient comments uh, from the study of patients who received palliative radiation. Um, I think that's very important. So take home, home points from this study. Uh, radiation can be an effective modality for palliation. Um, it's cost effective. It's two appointments, one planning appointment and one treatment. Um, it's non-invasive. Um, patients do need to be pre-medicated with Zofran, eight milligrams for the treatment, um, given that we're treating a large volume of liver. Um, another regimen, if you're worried about excessive toxicity with single fraction treatment, is doing five gray times two, given a few days apart. Um, so I thought this was a very important study and I want you to keep this option in mind for patients with diffuse liver mets or um, extensive primary HCC. All right, so um, moving on to esophagus cancer. Just going to present one trial that was, um, that was shared at GI ASCO. Um, so uh, there are basically two standards of care um, for patients with G-junction tumors um, based on the CROSS study and studies of perioperative chemo. So we know that the CROSS study randomized uh, with patients with um, esophagus or G-junction tumors. They could be adenocarcinoma or squamous cell carcinoma. And it showed that the addition of, of preoperative chemo radiation improved survival. Um, we also know that there were two studies, the MAGIC and the FLOT4 study, um, that looked at perioperative chemotherapy with either ECF or FLOT. Um, and if you look at the inclusion criteria in, this, in the studies, there's a lot of overlap. So basically, if you have a G-junction tumor, you could fall into either bucket. So this was the NeoAGIS trial. Um, it was presented at GI ASCO. Um, it was a randomized trial of uh, adenocarcinoma, uh, T2 to T3, N0 um, to three um, patients where they're randomized to either the cross regimen, so pre-op chemo radiation of 41.4 gray uh, with weekly carbotaxol versus perioperative chemotherapy um, with either FLOT um, or MAGIC. And important that in the study, only 15% received FLOT, so the majority of patients received um, ECF. Um, so what did the study find? Um, so there were fewer um, toxicities with preoperative chemoradiation, particularly hematologic toxicities. Um, path outcomes were improved with CROSS with a 17% pathologic complete response rate. But there was no difference in overall survival. You couldn't put two curves that were more overlapping basically the entire time. Um, overall survival has not changed between the two regimens. So just some comments on the study. So the primary endpoint of overall survival, um, similar, same between the two arms. Um, again, 15% of patients received FLOT. We know that is um, a better chemotherapy regimen than ECF. Um, this was done before Checkmate 577, um, which showed a benefit to adjuvant nivolumab um, for patients without a pathologic complete response. Um, CROSS appeared to have less toxicity. Um, I think we'll await quality of life data. Um, I think it's interesting that improved pathologic outcomes with CROSS did not translate to an overall survival improvement in the CROSS arm. Um, I think we can't say that individual patients, if you achieve a path CR, don't do better. I think those patients probably did, we don't know yet, um, but that didn't translate to improvement for their study arm. 
Um, I think it's very interesting that six to eight cycles of chemotherapy um, gave the same outcomes as weekly carbotaxol radiation. I can't quite put my head around that, but I think it's very interesting. Um, I think it asks the question, will further escalation of chemotherapy help in this population? And then I think very important is that we uh, need to see data on patterns of recurrence and obviously quality of life. Um, the ESOPEC study, which we anticipate results next year, um, looks at CROSS versus FLOT. So all those patients will see FLOT, um, so that will give further information on this question. Um, okay, so my take from the study, so I think local regional control, obviously I'm biased. Um, I think improving local regional control in itself is an important goal, um, particularly in scenarios where local recurrence can be morbid or difficult to salvage. Um, examples would be pre-op chemo radiation in rectal cancer, chemo radiation versus, um, I should say, radiation in anal cancer, and also post lumpectomy radiation in breast cancer. Um, so what do we do um, with patients with G-junction tumors at UT Southwestern? So if they're sewer three diffuse histology, then they're getting perioperative chemo starting with FLOT. Um, if after initial chemotherapy there is a concern for positive margins, we'll actually add preoperative chemo radiation with carbotaxol, so sort of like a FLOT and CROSS together uh, preoperatively. Um, for Stewart 1 and 2, we are sticking with CROSS um, and also considering induction full FOX for bulky tumors uh, per the CALGB study. Okay, so last part of my talk um, is a bit existential. Um, what is this picture? It actually has nothing to do with the talk, but our chair, Bob Timmerman, um, has a farm and he raises Wagyu beef. It's like his most proud accomplishment, so he likes to share this slide, so I wanted to as well. Okay, so radiation historically has not really been personalized. Um, treatment is really designed based on baseline scans and diagnosis, um, and conventional treatments are very um, burdensome. Um, so breast cancer, prostate cancer, lung cancer, rectal cancer, um, between five to eight weeks of daily treatments. And it's traditionally been very one size fits all. So traditionally we've sort of just categorized the patient into a group. Um, they receive uninterrupted therapy, and then later, sometimes three to six months later, we see if it works. And that can be tough for patients. You know, when we give radiation, they'll say, how do we know it works? You know, we're not taking the tumor out. And we say, well, we don't know until like half a year later. Um, and another downside of it is that we might burn bridges for using radiation later. Traditionally, radiation, we kind of give the maximum dose that is tolerable or safe for patients. Um, and I think we probably overtreat a lot of patients. Um, yeah, so I think some patients get overtreated and then have toxicity where they may not really need that treatment. So how can we tailor radiation to each patient in tumor? So that brings me to adaptive radiation. So what is adaptive radiation? It means responding to change. So now we have technology that can identify changes in the patient's anatomy, um, including the patient's tumor, and actually react to those changes by replanning the treatment very quickly, sometimes when the patient is still there. Um, so there is a concept um, that um, we're doing studies in called Pulsar, which is personalized ultra-fractionated ultra stereotactive ablative radiation. And um, the premise behind it is that we use a high dose, a pulse of focused radiation to halt tumor progression. And then we actually stop. So we don't give radiation the next day. We actually stop, uh, monitor biological the biological processes that follow, and then plan the next dose of radiation actually tailored to that tumor. Um, so here are some examples outside of the GI, um, uh, outside of GI tumor. So this is a per patient uh, with a recurrent malignant brain tumor. They were diagnosed with an oligoastrocytoma in 2012. They got surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation. Um, 10 years later, um, had a biopsy that confirmed a glioblastoma. Um, attempted salvage radiation with, um, with chemotherapy, uh, was not effective. Um, so started this pulsar regimen of radiation. They got Temidar, Avastin, and then radiation every three weeks with pembrolizumab. So this was the first plan. They were treated on an MRI LINAC, um, and they got five treatments total separated by three weeks, and you can see the tumor responding. Um, so adaptation can decrease toxicity. We adapt to shape. Um, based on change between treatments. You can see here, this is a patient getting treated for lung cancer. 
You know, additionally, their tumor is, initially their tumor is this size, and before the next treatment, it's gotten a lot smaller. So if you treat according to the initial plan, you're gonna be treating a lot of the lung. And unfortunately, this is what we've done for the past decades in radiation, but it's not what we need to do, what we have to do. Um, so this is a patient with metastatic melanoma, um, initially treated with ipinevo and then a MEK inhibitor, um, had three years of progression-free survival, but then started to progress rapidly. Uh, the patient was bedridden, had severe pain, a high tumor burden in the liver, in the spine, and on the skin. Um, so how was this patient treated? So they received radiation to all three sites with nivolumab. Um, and then you can see that even though the radiation, I don't know how to go back, was only to one part of the liver, they actually responded it in the entire liver um, with nivolumab, which they had pr previously progressed on, and the patient is currently NED times 36 months. I mean, obviously, these are anecdotal. There might have been something about this patient's biology that the tumor became more quiescent, um, but I think interesting to think about. So how can this concept be beneficial in GI, specifically rectal cancer? So we talked about adaptation of radiation to treatment response. Um, because we're separating the radiation by weeks, we're reducing toxicity, which might permit dose escalation. Um, it could allow interdig interdigitation of radiation with chemotherapy, full flux chemotherapy, and potentially, you know, the last one is more hypothesis generating uh, potentially longer intervals of radiation could augment systemic anti-tumor immune responses if you were to combine it with a systemic agent. So this is a trial that we have at UT Southwestern. Um, basically, these patients, uh, they have locally advanced rectal cancer. They get six months of chemotherapy um, with either Folfox or Kpox, um, and they get radiation every four weeks. So instead of every day, which is traditionally what's done in short course radiation, it's basically short course, by, but separated by weeks. So five doses given every four weeks. Um, and the dose to the gross tumor is escalated. So instead of five gray, which is given in short course, it goes from six to seven to eight gray. And then patients who have a complete response are, um, are getting non-operative management. Okay, so this is one patient on the study. Um, he was on the uh, second dose level, getting seven gray per fraction. Um, so at baseline, uh, we're, co we're collecting correlated studies, um, but you can see his tumor, it's a distal tumor. Um, you can see it on, in the, on the endoscopy as well. Um, and mid-treatment by three radiation pulses and three months of chemotherapy, he actually had a complete response on MRI and on endoscopy and actually cleared his ctDNA. Um, this patient's now completed treatment on the study. We're not allowing patients to stop treatment even if they clear halfway. Um, but you can imagine in the future that a patient like this might not need the six months of chemotherapy, might not need the five um, treatments of radiation. Um, anyway, so look forward to finishing this study and hoping to report uh, the outcome soon. All right, so just to end, I know that was like a whirlwind presentation of radiation in GI cancers. Um, I think there is a role for the judicious use of radiotherapy across GI cancers sites and stages. Um, radiation dose matters, you know, radiobiology is real. Um, as it stands, radiotherapy is mostly one size fits all. Uh, traditionally, technology has guided radiation therapy, um, but really biology and patient preference should. Um, technology is good, we've traditionally been a very technology focused field, um, but we really need to show improvements in quality of life and obviously cancer outcomes. Um, and really our goal um, is personalization of radiotherapy including better integration with systemic therapy um, with the goal of increasing efficacy, decreasing toxicity, and improving the therapeutic ratio. All right, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Just outside of logistics and um, you know, I guess, uh, like, philosophical difference between institutions. Uh, Short-term, you know, uh, radiation for patients and rectal cancer, wh where, like, who is the ideal candidate in, in, in your head? <laughs> yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so I think, you know, the, the Rapidos study, the update, um, which I didn't present in detail, showed increased local occurrence with um, short-course radiation. 
Obviously, that's very provocative. It was a nearly 1,000 patient study, three times bigger than the older studies. Um, but those patients were advanced, so they had very high risk locally advanced tumors. So it's obviously a continuum. There's going to be patients who don't need radiation. The prospect study will clarify that. And then patients who need long course chemo radiation, even dose escalated um, radiation. Um, so I think short course for mid upper rectal tumors um, and for locally advanced rectal tumors that don't have the really high risk features, I think it's still a good strategy. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. All right, we'll now take a break for lunch to our virtual audience. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, we hope you tune back in, in tomorrow for some great presentations. We'll head out into the exhibit room. There'll be some lunch. You can grab a plate, head back in here, grab a seat, mingle with everyone, and connect. And then we'll meet back after lunch for our Meet the Investigator session.